Chapter 3 is where we're going to be, and while you're doing that, children are dismissed to Children's Church. So Acts chapter 3, to answer an important question before we get started, yes, I am wearing my navy and Carolina blue plaid jacket in memory of the Texas area of Carolina beating Duke last night. So, you know, priorities, and as soon as they won, I knew what I was wearing today. The, the, joy of, the joy of watching that happen in, in Duke was even better. So, we are, we are looking at the book of Acts. and So, we finished up Acts chapter 2 last week, talking about that the church has now been filled with the Spirit and has been commissioned to go. And we see that Peter preached and 3,000 came to know Christ and that it wasn't that they stopped there, but that was the beginning point for the launch of the church to go out. So today we're going to continue that and look at what the Spirit-filled church does in our lives. And so what is the characteristics of a Spirit-filled church? So let's look at chapter 3. We're going to read it quickly and then pray. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple for the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. A man who was lame from birth was being carried there. He was placed each day at the temple gate called Beautiful, so that he could beg from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for money. Peter, along with John, looked straight at him and said, Look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. Then taking him by the right hand, he raised him up, and at once his feet and ankles became strong. So he jumped up and started to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and, and beg at the beautiful gate of the temple. So they were filled with awe and astonished at what had happened to him. While he was holding on to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astonished, ran toward them in what was called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he had addressed the people. Fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why do you stare at us as though we had made him walk by our own power or godliness? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied before Pilate, though he had decided to release him. You denied the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer released to you. You killed the source of life whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in his name, his name has made the man strong whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through Jesus has given him the perfect health in front of all of you. And now, brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your leaders also did. In this way, God fulfilled what he had predicted through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Therefore, therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. Heaven must receive him until the time of restoration of all things which God spoke about through his holy prophets from the beginning. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers and sisters. You must listen to everything he tells you, and everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from the people. In addition, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel to those after him have also foretold these days. You were the sons of the prophets and the covenant that God made with your ancestors, saying to Abraham, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through your offspring. God's, God raised up his servant and sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your evil ways. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, God. I thank you that we can be in your presence. Father, I thank you that we can 
hear stories of healing, of stories of restoration, and know that those stories don't end when Scripture closes, but those stories continue. And God, even more than that, that the ultimate restoration is coming. The day when you make us all new. So, Father, I pray that you will speak to us through your word. Help us know what you have for us this morning. Pray all these things, your sons, precious and holy name. Amen. So, I, I was reminded yesterday of the importance of knowing the job at hand. I uh, had the privilege or distinction or whatever honor it is to work at my family service station for, for several years and learned quite a bit. My dad's a mechanic. My stepdad's a mechanic. My father-in-law is a mechanic. Like there are mechanics that people know cars around me. And, and, and so from osmosis, I've learned enough to do some things. So Friday, I made the decision I need to cut where the fenced-in part of our yard is because it just gotten a little long and with it getting warmer, I didn't want snakes to come where the kids play and things like that. And so I get my lawnmower out that I haven't used in a while and fire it up. And as soon as I put a little bit of go into it, it dies. And so it took me 20 minutes to cut a strip where I'd start it, push, die, start it, push, die. And I realized this is probably too much. So I told Cassidy, I said, Saturday's coming. I'm going to, after dance, we're, I'm going to just stay outside and I'm going to work on this lawnmower. And so I get out there and I, I start talking to my father-in-law. Hey, you got any suggestions? And he tells me what to do and I start messing with it. And that didn't help as much as it, I thought it should. And so then I call my dad, I'm talking to, he, he had called me, and so I'm talking to him, and I tell him what I'm doing. He's like, Brandon, just put the thing up. You can't fix it, which made me even matter. And I said, oh, I will fix this if I have to tear it apart and put it back piece by piece. And so I, I start working, and I'm like, okay, I know I, I'm going to go get some carburetor cleaner and spray out the carburetor, and, and I've now taken off not only to flush the fuel system, but now I've taken off the top of the mower. I've taken off part of the carburetor. I am determined to fix this. And as I am getting back with new gas and carburetor cleaner, I'm ready to go. And I'm like, I, I don't care what happens. This lawnmower will be fixed. And I'm going to send a video of my dad, to my dad of just me cutting the grass, smiling. So I go to put it back together after spraying the carburetor only to realize that there's two bolts that snapped off in the middle of me doing all this. Now I can't put it back together at all. So I throw it back in the, the shed and Cassidy said, are you going to call your dad? I said, I'm not talking to him for a little while. We're just... See, the truth of the matter is, is if we're not careful, we can know enough to get us in trouble, but not know enough to get the job done. For you and for I, and for me, as we are in church, we know that part of our purpose is to come here to sing praises to God, to gather as a body of believers and to study Scripture. But if that is the end of our faith, that it's about coming to church, praising Jesus' name, studying God's Word, going home and coming back in a couple of days then we're missing the mark of putting into practice what we know. See, you and I can tell stories and story after people who the church has let down because the church has sang about a loving Savior, but have been too busy for them. And for you and for, for me, we must put into practice and be spirit-filled people, not when we're singing Amazing Grace. That's important, but when we're sharing about that amazing grace to someone who's never heard of Jesus. See, the more statistics I study, the more I, I learn, uh, the more I'm realizing we are past the point of a Christian nation. There are more people in Charlotte that have never stepped foot in church. You, you know, it used to be that I was told there's unreached people groups 
in the far parts of the world and you'd see a map and you'd see, hey, there's some place in the Middle East, there's some place in China, there's some place in Russia, there's places in Asia, there's places in Africa, maybe even in Brazil or South America. Those are the places that need to hear the gospel. But here, here's the amazing thing about Charlotte and, and also the sad thing. The amazing thing is this. The nations, you don't have to get on a plane to go to them anymore. You just have to walk across the street. Sad part is, there's still an unreached people groups in this area because we as Christians don't walk across the street enough. And so what we see here in Acts chapter 3 is when God's people are spirit-filled, God's people are powerful to make a stand. That when we are spirit-filled, the church moves. And so let's look at this and see what, what the passage is speaking to us. And so look at verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple for the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. It just simply... Peter and John have now experienced the resurrection of Christ. They've experienced the ascension of Christ. They've experienced Pentecost. And they said, our first goal is to continue praising and praying as we are called to do. Our our first goal is to continue going into the temple. See, they didn't feel that their faith that they had was, was lost. They just felt that they figured it was fully complete now. See, they understood what Moses was talking about. And so they were going to the temple to continue worshiping the same God that rescued the Israelites that now rescues all people through Jesus. And they go at 3 o'clock and and so this, this time of day perhaps even then held special significance for them. Possibly because in John 19.30 it talks about how that's the time that Jesus cried on the cross that it's finished. Maybe this was just the common practice for them, but whatever the reason, these two apostles walk into the busiest time of prayer. And so they are part of this large group, large people moving in. And what we see in verse 2 is that there is a lame man, a man who was lame from birth was being carried there. He was placed each day at the temple gate called Beautiful so that he could beg from those entering the temple. See, as, as Peter and John started moving in with the group of people, they encounter a beggar. Now, what we need to understand is this is a big juxtaposition of seeing this crippled man who is being carried and placed at the mat next to the gate that they call beautiful because it was far exceeded value of those, any gate that's plated in, with silver set in bronze. See, it had Corinthian bronze, and it was 50 cubits high and 40 cubits wide. Basically, it was huge and beautiful. I mean, the text tells us it's a beautiful gate. It's this ornate, and it is a picture of God's glory coming into the temple. And what we see is brokenness and desperation in front of it. And so this is the encounter that we begin to see. And so in verse 3, it says, When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for money. Peter, along with John, looked straight at him and, and said, Look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. There is this beautiful picture you can relate with Peter and John right you have had someone ask you for money you, you can drive to Charlotte there, there's particularly a place Sardis Road North if where the Chili's is and, and Walmart is if you stop at that light turning back onto Independence there is someone always there and whether you entertain, whether you offer money, offer food, or roll up the window and lock the door, whatever it is, you can relate to what is going on in this situation. Because all of that is happening. You have people walking by, ignoring him. But he was smart because you're going to the temple and part of the practice is to be generous. So this is actually a pretty good spot for him and he's being handed money as people go in. 
and so that they can proclaim, look how good I am. And he turns to Peter and John and says, hey, can you help me out with some money? Can you help me out? I, I can't work. I, I've not been able to walk since I was born, and so I need help. And Peter and John look at him and say, look at us. I get this picture of this, this beautiful like expectation that is coming. Not only do you just toss him some coins, you're saying, look at me. And so I, I get this feeling that he's like, oh, this might really pay off. And Peter follows it up with gold and silver. I have none. It almost feels like this cruel moment for the beggar to say, why would you even have me look at you if you were going to tell me you have nothing to give? But Peter follows it up with, but what I do have in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. To get up and walk. See, Peter says, look, there's nothing that I have that's far greater than Jesus. Amen. Peter is saying that the change would help him. But walking changes his life. Oh, yeah. For you and for, I, for me, Jesus changes our life. Oh, yeah. When we have an encounter with Jesus, and, and here's the beautiful part. This is not him praying, Jesus, come help. This is a Spirit-filled man proclaiming that through Jesus he can walk. Because it doesn't stop with Jesus changes lives. Spirit-filled followers of Jesus impact the lives of us, those around us. And so we see that. And so what happens next in 7 and 8 is this. It says, Then taking him by the right hand, he raised him up. And at once his feet and ankles became strong, so he jumped up and started to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Can I tell you something? My prayer this week has been this. When people come in contact with me, I want them leaping, praising God. When people come in contact with Clear Creek Baptist Church, I want them leaping, praising God. Because of who he is. Not because of what I am what we are, but because we serve and we're filled with the Spirit of God. But it's interesting, Luke actually uses some, some language here that, that is, is actually medical. What he's actually talking about here is when he, when he talks, he, he is saying that it snaps in place. These are medical terms from Dr. Luke uh, of in his ankles coming together. That his bones are being set in place. That it's not just a miracle of he couldn't walk and now he could. His legs, the bone structure has changed. Oh, yeah. And Peter being quick and brash that we give him credit for and curse him for. Steps up in the moment and grabs the man's hands and yanks him up. Now I... I get this feeling, I, I've had enough knee injuries where I couldn't walk, that I, I get this feeling of nervousness when, when I remember someone tried to help me get out of bed because they were taking me to the hospital and I couldn't walk. And, and my brother deciding, I'm going to pull you up. I'm like, this is going to hurt badly. So I get this image of Peter bending down and yanking him up and all of a sudden there's panic and then he realizes, I'm standing. I'm leaping. I'm moving. And, and his immediate response is to run into the temple praising God. His immediate response is that this articulation of the joint has changed his life. That it snapped back. See, I think sometimes in my life, I miss the drama of these moments. Because I read this, and this is not a new story to me. But we miss the real drama of a moment where this man is sitting, giving up because all he can do is ask for money at a gate, hoping that the religious people of the time are generous. And in the next instant, his ankles have snapped back and he's jumping for joy. Amen. What drama we see. 
what, what heaviness this really is. And, and so this man is leaping. And all the people saw him walking around praising God and they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate of the temple. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what happened to him. See, not only did it affect the beggar, it affected everyone who saw because they saw, I've been walking past this gate for years and he's always sitting there. Why is he doing this now? Life change makes more life change. It leaves more people astonished by who God is. But then he continues. See, the the Spirit-filled church imparts wonder. There's this what happened. There's this awe and wonder of it all. The Spirit-filled church imparts joy. This crippled man goes from begging to leaping. I read it this way, or read earlier this week. The Spirit-filled church draws the world to itself and to its Savior. If you and I want to be a Spirit-filled church, we're drawing people to Jesus. Not with condemnation, but with proclamation of who Jesus is. All of it. We own up to, we have a standard biblically, but we have a Savior who restores us when we're broken. And then we see this, that the Spirit-filled church, that the Spirit-filled church not only imparts joy and wonder, but how the Spirit-filled church imparts it. See, when the Spirit-filled church begins to exhibit power and healing, there is a danger to avoid people. There is a danger to avoid. See, people may focus on Christ's servants rather than on Christ. See, everybody looks to Peter, to John. And, and so while he was holding on to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astonished, ran toward them in what is called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people, fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why do you stare at us as though we made him walk by our own power or godliness? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom he handed over whom you handed over and denied before Pilate, though he had decided to release him. See, it would have been really easy for Peter and John to say, I did a great job. I, look, look at what I did because I am so connected to Jesus that this is what happened. But Peter and John are like, what are you looking at? What are you doing? See, we're tempted when good things happen for us to look and go, look what I did. I know that because going to youth conference after youth conference for 13 years in youth ministry, what I'd always discover is this. The number one question at the conference is, so how big is your youth group? How big are you drawing? How many people have you baptized? These are questions that, that people want to know varying sizes. But the truth of the matter is, I don't care if we are a church of 50 or we're a church of 5,000. If people are coming to know Jesus, it's not about us, it's about Jesus. You and I don't do anything other than connect to what God is calling us to do and take steps of being service. You and I, we are not the focus. And Peter says that, why are you looking at us? What do you think we did? He said, Jesus did this. That Jesus is the one that came. Jesus is the one that died. And he even goes back on. He goes back to what he said in chapter 2. You denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted among you. He even goes back. No, see, you wanted Jesus to die on a cross, the one that gave me the power to do this, while you wanted a murderer to run free. You had the option, and what did you choose? You had a choice. But, but he goes on. In verse 15, he says it this way. You killed the source of life whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. See, you killed him. God raised him. That you, and, and I think of this, and the truth of the matter is, I think Peter's preaching as much to himself as he is to the people. Because remember, Peter denied in that moment. 
But Peter also recognizes the power that hung Jesus on the cross was not Caesar. It was sin. And it was the love of us and the sin of ours that kept him on the cross. And God raised him. The apostle says, listen, Israel, it is through the name of Jesus that this miracle has happened. See, many people decide who and what you are when they hear your name. I could read you certain names and it would get a reaction out of you. I could say Billy Graham and you have a thought that comes to mind. I could say JFK and you'd have a thought. I mean, shoot, you can name the last two presidents and it automatically starts a fight on TV nowadays. Names bring reputation and power. And what Peter is saying is, look, there's one name that has real power, and that is Jesus. There is one name. See, more exactly, the healing happened through faith in Christ's name. That by faith in his name, verse 16, his name was made this, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through Jesus has given him this perfect health in front of all of you. We need to hold to the faith of Jesus. That we know the name that has power and we need to have faith in him. See, the church had power because it had faith in Jesus' name. It's fully trusted. It's so simple, but it's so true. See, we try to complicate it with so many things at times. We want to we argue this or that. We want to argue this theological point or that theological point. And at the end of the day, those are fun discussions if you're interested in that, but they're not what saves us. It is about Jesus in the name of Jesus. That's what saves us. It's not how much theology we can quote. It's not how religious my family was, how many times we checked off an attendance box, how many times we gave money to the poor. Those things do not save us. What saves us is Jesus. See, we need to remember that our faith is a gift. It does not come through the resolution of humans' will, but asking God to grant it. Uh, as uh, on speaking on this this passage, um, J.D. Greer says that there's four directions that this passage points you. First one is this: it points you upward. Verse 15 says that you. You killed the source of life whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses. See, Peter says, you killed the author of life, but God raised him. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, Our great salvation was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. God also bearing witness by signs and wonders, various miracles by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. See, miracles were God's way of saying, this is really me. See, sometimes we, we try to rationalize everything. Forty years ago, it became popular to say that the true academic would never po- like, focus on a miracle as an explanation for some historical or scientific phenomenon. See, before, about, before the discovery of thermo... Easy for me to say... Thermodynamics, this is why I didn't go into science. We just assumed that God powered the sun, and that's, that was the explanation. But now we understand the science of how it works, because God coordinated a system for the sun to produce heat and light. Right. See, it's not to say that God's not involved in it. And I, I honestly think Christians shouldn't be scared of science. Because it seems like every time somebody dives real deep in science, true getting to the answer, it keeps pointing back to to who God is. It it keeps pointing back to who He is. So we shouldn't be scared to have conversations in science. We should say, keep digging, and you'll see Jesus. Because verse 15 says He's the source of life. So, but 40 years ago it was, we don't talk about miracles. Nothing is, we turn it to God. That was the academic principle. 
But the truth of the matter is, miracles still happen. And we cannot separate the two. 